So let's imagine that the government invented a way to read your mind and determine how much you're willing to pay for something. Then they went about sharing this information with corporations that they can charge you more money for products and services. They could use this technology to charge you more just because you need it or you're willing to pay more. Well, in fact, let me tell you that this is not a conspiracy. This is totally real. And this helps prop up a half a trillion dollar industry in the United States. So let's get into this. But remember, video notes are in the description. So right here, we are in Desmos. Suppose that when you go to the store, they somehow scan your brain and determine how much you're willing to pay, then adjust the price. This can theoretically work if you have two conditions, a non-competitive market, since the supply is tightly controlled, and you're selling something that can't easily be arbitrage. Arbitrage is just buying and reselling. If you can get a hold of something at a low price and resell it to people who can only buy it at a high price, this will make your mind reading strategy much less effective. For this example, we are going to assume these conditions are true. Our demand curve is in red. Our supply curve is in blue. We have our mind reading effectiveness, which we can adjust with this orange slider right here, which applies our mind reading. M is just a measure of the amount of causation between the consumer's demand and the price they pay. You know, if you have a high demand, the more amount of mind reading the higher the price that you will be charged. Our marginal revenue curve right here is affected by the amount of mind reading we are using. The more effective that mind reading is, the less revenue that we will lose by increasing quantity. This is because the price is set more by individual demand than marginal demand. We're able to charge those people a different price, which is less connected with the price the marginal consumer will pay. Thus, the lost revenue is less. So right here we have our minimum price and quantity, and price right here is a function, and it's a function of the individual demand and mind reading effectiveness. And the more effective that they can read consumers' mind, the more they can charge the consumers their maximum willingness to pay. Those who are willing to pay more are charged more. As we can see, the more mind reading that we employ, the top price increases and the lowest price decreases. Now, in all of these examples, we have social welfare. Now, non-competitive markets do have a loss in social welfare, as they're more focused on marginal revenue as opposed to demand. So there definitely is a loss. But we need to remember that social welfare is lost by a decrease in quantity supplied. Beneficial trade occurs when the benefits are greater than the cost. In this case, that is while demand is greater than supply. So when we increase mind reading, we are able to increase the quantity supplied. And since we can charge people different prices with our mind reading, we increase the quantity. And thus, this will recover our lost social welfare, bringing us closer and closer to the competitive welfare. Now, we also have the consumer surplus and the producer surplus. These are the gains from trade that go to the producers and the consumers. Now, notice that mind reading will increase the consumer surplus for high demand consumers, but it will also transfer it to the producers and the marginal consumers. Down here, these people now get gains from trade, but these people get less gains from trade. Now, if we can do this perfectly, this will achieve a competitive social welfare. This will also transfer the entire social welfare to the producer, leaving no consumer surplus. This is technically efficient. This is because we are charging everyone their exact willingness to pay. So there is no loss in revenue by adding the marginal consumer. This phenomena is called price discrimination. Now, for the big reveal of what this is, this is just FAFSA and the university system in America. Students are simply asked to fill out an application for student aid so that they can get help paying for their tuition. This data is then used by the government and colleges to determine how much they will charge you for university. They simply repackage this as student aid. The tuition is the highest price that you could pay. This is also why often the price of tuition for many is skyrocketing. But if you actually look at some of the trends, the average cost of tuition is not actually following the same trend. This is because tuition is often seen as max tuition or the highest tuition. So the average price paid is actually not changing. Sometimes it's even going down, in fact, year to year. Since in reality, most people are not expected to pay 
the full price. The statistics often show the top price and say, well, this is what tuition costs. But only the rich are really the ones paying those high tuition rates. The rich people are determined to be the ones that are able to pay. Their demand is the highest. The more money that you have, the higher your demand will be. But this creates a really interesting problem, as the more effectively that they can do college price discrimination, it will work to reduce students and their middle-income families down to a more equal distribution of non-university expenditures. If you think about it, the more money you earn from working, while that will increase your demand, the willingness you'll be able to pay for something. So if you can charge people their willingness to pay, the more money you earn, the more they can charge you. So it wipes out potentially some of the effects of earning more money. This could be a problem. So thank you very much for watching. I will see you in the next video.